<laughs> yeah, you can go and have a seat. <laughs> Aaron's a little nervous this morning, you know, he kind of forgets the cues that he's supposed to give you guys. Uh, well, welcome everybody to get to the uh, Crossings Church this morning and let you know uh, that we are really, really glad that you're here today. Uh, I can say that especially because for the last several weeks, uh, I've been gone. I, we, we did a couple church camps, we did vacation, we did a college retreat. And so out of the last several weeks, I've only been able to be here a couple because I also preached at our church in Collinsville. And so uh, for me to be back here at home in Winsville today is exciting. And uh, I think it's exciting for me because of what I've seen taking place here. You know, I have a lot of minister friends around the country. And uh, a lot of them tell me when they go on vacation, they really dread going back home, you know, and they have to go deal with all this stuff. And for me, I can't wait to get back home because I really do believe that God is doing some really cool things in the lives of the people here at the Crossings Church. And uh, if you haven't been around here very long, what you will eventually begin to see is you'll get to hear stories of people who are here at the church, and you'll know what they were like before, and you'll know some of their stories, and, you'll, and then you'll see what they're like now, and you're like, okay, I see why people are excited to be here, because God is doing some really, really cool things in the lives of the people here. Uh, and so it's also an exciting week because our campus ministry goes back to school, which I get to work with a lot, so I'm excited for that. But I'm just glad to be home uh, with all of you. Last week at The Crossings, we started a new uh, series of lessons, and it's a different kind of series of lessons maybe than what you would normally hear at church, but uh, it's called Ticked Off by Jesus. And uh, there are lots of things, if you read the Bible, that you will find out about Jesus and lots of things that he says that may kind of make you angry. And, you know, we live in a society today where, uh, we, where people want to paint this picture of Jesus like he would never make anybody upset and he would never say anything that was controversial or that might make people get angry with him. And I've heard people over the years say things like, man, if Christians, you know, if they were like Jesus, then people wouldn't get mad at him, wouldn't get angry with him and, and have all these frustrations with Christians. And my answer to that has pretty much always been the same, and that is, you, you know they killed Jesus, right? And, and they didn't kill him because everything he said was flowery and beautiful. Uh, they killed him because they didn't like a lot of what he had to say and what it meant for their lives. And that hasn't changed in the course of the last 2,000 years. If you look into God's word, there are lots of things that you can read that are awesome and incredible and beautiful and gracious, and there's mercy and there's love, and that's what it is all about. But there are also things that you will read and when you look at your own life and you hear the things that Jesus says, you may look and be like, I can't believe he said that to me. Because you realize when you're reading God's word that it's talking directly to you, right? It wasn't just meant for every random person. It has a specific message for each and every one of us. So when you read God's word, it was intended for you to hear and it was intended for you to heed or to, to obey and do what it says. And so there are moments where we look at God's word and we get really angry, but ultimately we have to ask ourselves the question, who is our view of Jesus going to be shaped by? You know, you talked about this a little bit last week, and really you have three options. Your view of Jesus can be shaped by yourself, just what you want to think, what you want to feel, what you want to believe about Jesus. That can shape your view. It can also be shaped by society. So whatever society tells you that you should believe about Jesus, the picture that they paint of him, you can choose to believe that or you can get into scripture and you can say, what does the Bible actually say about Jesus? What, did, what were his words? What were his actions? Who was he? What did he mean? Why did he say the things that he said? And when you re if you really want to get down to it, scripture is the only way to get a real picture of God. To really understand who Jesus was and what he said, you have to look into the word of God. And you have to put aside all of your, your, your biases that you have or that society's built into you. And you have to look into word, the word of God and say, all right, this is who Jesus is. This is what he meant. And this is what he wanted me to do with it. But when you do that, be warned, you're going to come across some things that you're going to not like at all. And I can tell you that because I know that that is true for my own life. There are times I'll read stuff the Bible says and Jesus said, and I'm like, what? You gotta be kidding me. And, and it's easy for my pride to puff up and for me to get angry and to get upset and get ticked off with Jesus. But ultimately, I've come to an understanding, and that is this. Regardless of how hard some of the things the Bible says or what I believe them to be or how I feel about them, there's never been a point in my life where I've listened, listened to Jesus or God's word and obeyed it, even though I may not have liked it in the moment where it didn't bless my life when I did what he said. 
And being a parent, that's a lesson that I've learned. There are times whenever my children, whether they're toddlers or now, you know, they're in their teenage years. When I, when I deal with them, there are things that I say that they are not going to like, regardless of how nicely I say them, right? And I don't say those things to be mean to my children. I don't say them to be harsh. I don't say them just to hurt them. I say them even when they're hard or harsh because I love my children and I want what's best for them. And while they may not understand that in the moment, that is true in the scope of our relationship. And when it comes to God's word and we're looking at these things Jesus said, you need to, you need to understand he isn't trying to hurt you. He isn't trying to just tick you off. He knows you might get angry, but what he says in his word is meant for our benefit because of his deep love and care and concern for us and his longing to be in relationship with him. But he also realizes you can't shy away from the truth when you really love somebody. You have to tell them what they need to hear regardless if it hurts them or not. There are things that we all need to hear in our lives that we're not gonna like. And if you've been in friendships and relationships for very long, you know that a real friend will tell you what you need to hear, not what you wanna hear. And that's what Jesus does. And so today we're going to be looking at a, a specific passage in Matthew chapter 7. And, and the specific sentence we're going to look at is uh, this. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he's talking and he's, he's given this lesson, he is talking to a bunch of people who are religious. These are people who go to church, basically, all right? And he's talking to me. He's like, look, just because you say Lord, Lord doesn't mean you're getting to heaven. Now, if you're a religious person and Jesus is saying that to you, I have a feeling you're not going to like what he has to say. You're going to probably be angered by it. And, and the question that we have to ask ourselves is why does this passage anger and shock me when I read it? And I think there's a few reasons. And I think the first reason is just this. I'm afraid that he could be talking to me. You know, it, this is one of those moments where the religious people are probably looking at Jesus like, you talking to me? And he's like, yeah, I am. And, they're, and they start to get angry. But also in our own lives, when you read scripture, it was written to you. So when Jesus says, listen, you need to know that not everyone who calls me Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You should, you should read that and take it personally because he's talking to each and every one of us. And we need to understand that just because you go to church or just because you claim Christianity, just because you say you believe in Jesus does not mean that you're right with him. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to heaven either. And that's a scary thing. And when we get scared, we tend to get angry, especially us guys, right? It's, it's rare you hear a guy, you know, even when they're hurt, when guys' feelings get hurt, we say we're angry, right? You no, know, you're hurt. No, I'm mad. Yeah, but you're also hurt. You know, same thing when we get scared, you know, we're like, yeah, I'm angry. The, statements like this bring about fear and bring about anger. And sometimes they take us off. And I think sometimes it's because we understand when, if we're really being honest and we're looking at our own lives as people who would claim to be religious, people who would go to church, and we look at our own lives and we look at the way we live and the decisions we make day in and day out, and we look at that passage and he says, look, you may not be getting there. And we're like, he's talking to me. And that's a reason to take it really seriously and not to just blow it off. And it might make you angry, but we need to hear it because it's what allows us to change in the future. The second thing is, is that sometimes we get angry or, or feel shocked by this because we've been taught this idea that I thought all I needed to do to be saved was to believe. And there is a sense in which that is true if you are defining biblical belief correctly. But see, what most people today do is they want to believe that belief is simply this intellectual thought that goes on in your head that God exists and that Jesus is his son. Many, 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 many people, the majority of people in the United States would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a believer. But when it comes to actually believing and having faith in God, a biblical definition of faith that says you're willing to put your trust in it, that you're willing to live based upon those beliefs, that you're willing to do what God says, that's what faith is actually biblically defined as. Not just knowing he's there, that Jesus is God's son, but actually doing those things that's a whole different ball game. And so what, what kind of modern Christianity has told people is, oh, don't worry about the way you live. Don't worry about what happens when you leave here. Don't worry about your life. Just believe that he, God exists and that Jesus is his son and you're saved. But the, the scary thing about that is, is Jesus himself right here says, look, not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. You don't call Jesus Lord if you don't believe he is who he says he is, Right? So what he's telling us is there's more to belief in Jesus than just knowing that he exists or that he's God's son. 
And so it ticks people off hearing this because it goes against the narrative that modern Christianity has taught people that all you have to do is know God exists and believe that because there's more to it than that. And then the third reason that this passage angers and shocks a lot of us is a personal one, and that is, do I have loved ones who may not have made it? You see, Jesus is talking to these religious people, and they have people who came before them who were religious, who taught them to be religious. And when Jesus says this, they understand he's not only talking to them, but maybe people who have come before them. And there are people in our lives who we love, and and we long for them to have a right relationship with God, but they may not. And sometimes, you know, you, you look at those people and you're like, man, this is crazy. If you've ever been to a funeral before, right, and you walked in and the, and the guy got up and started giving a sermon about the person that you knew, right, and they start talking about all the stuff and they're talking about how good of a godly man it, that person was and how they're in heaven now. And in your head, you're thinking to yourself, what? They, they're not talking to the same dude about the same dude that I knew, right? Because the guy I knew didn't care about God at all. And the guy I knew could have cared less whether or not he ended up in heaven. You know, and you're thinking these things in your head, but you know, people don't say those things, right? But these passages like this tick us off sometimes because God's saying, look, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot more to it than what you believe. And not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will in the kingdom of heaven. That's a scary thing. You know, growing up, I, I, I talk about this quite a bit, but I had a lot of friends who started coming to church with me who came from pretty rough and, and messed up backgrounds. And a couple of my friends became Christians when we were in high school. A couple of them walked away. One of them decided after going to prison for dealing drugs that he needed to change his life and came back to God. And he helps with one of our church plants now, which is an incredibly powerful and cool story. And it lets all of you know that uh, God's grace is phenomenal. But there was this other friend that we kept looking towards and we're like, man, we, 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 we kind of target and we said, all right, we got to get our other friends back. They, gotta, they need to be faithful. They need to know what God says. They need to obey him if their lives are going to be good, if they're going to end up in eternity with us. So when, when Marlon came back, we're like, okay, who's up? James. We got to get love it, you know? And uh, so we, we started talking to James. And I've been talking to him for years trying to say, James, you know what's right, man. Turn your life around. Look, your life isn't turning out well. You, your woman of 20 years left you because you wouldn't marry her. You know, you walked, you walked her as far away from God as possible. You're, everything's falling apart. And uh, James got cancer, and it was pretty scary. And he still wasn't listening to God. And then finally, after a while, I think it settled in. And for the last several months, James has been going to church at the inner belt and has turned his life around. He's going, to, he's going to small groups. He's repented. And this past week, James got the news that he has three months to live. And that's a heartbreaking thing. You know, and I think about, man, it, to think about losing one of your childhood friends to cancer is awful. But we were talking to James at his house the other night, and we were like, love it. What do you want to do? You know, like, you're not just going to lay here in this bed and rot away. You know, there's got to be stuff you want to do. Like, and he's like, well, I wanted to go fishing in Kentucky. And we're like, we're going to fishing in Kentucky then. He's like, I don't think I'm strong enough in two weeks. I'm like, man, we will pick you up and put you in the boat. Like, whatever we have to do to make this work. And as we talked about what he really wanted to do, it was pretty neat because there was a moment where we had, we listened to this song. We were talking about God and family and he, and we were talking about what he wants to do these last three months. And he just kind of sat there and he, he kind of looked at it and he goes, man, I'm just so glad to finally be home. That was the best thing I could have heard that whole day. Because we want the people who we love to be with us in eternity. But we also understand there's a realization that Jesus says, listen, not everyone's gonna make it and he expects things out of us. He expects us to believe in a way that puts our trust and our faith in him. And to see my, my, my boy from all those years ago come back to God and make that decision is the best thing he could do. And it made a very horrible and sad and could have been tragic situation so much better so much better than it would have been. And all of us have those people in our lives. See, those, those, that passage ticks us off because we don't like what it has to say. But it really shouldn't come as a surprise to us. It shouldn't be surprising to us that, that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be lost because Jesus told us that many people will not make it. If you look at Matt, Matthew chapter 7, just a few verses before he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 13, he says this, go in through the narrow gate. The gate that leads to destruction is broad and the road is wide. 
And so many people enter through it, but the gate that leads to life is narrow and the road is difficult. So, peop- so few people will find it. And he paints this picture and he says, listen, everybody, I know everybody wants to get to heaven, but the road to heaven is much more narrow than the road to destruction is. And he says, you know, you need to make sure you do whatever you can to get to this narrow road. But he says, it's a lot harder. It's more difficult of a road. And everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody really seems to want to pay the price to do what it takes because it's not an easy road. Anytime you see Jesus talk about relationship with him and living life with him, he never paints it like it's all going to be like rainbows and flowers, right? He says, look, this isn't going to be easy. And that's why the road to heaven, that's why the road to salvation is more narrow because most people don't want to walk that road because it's hard to do. But there's this broad road that is so easy. You can do whatever you want. You can live however you want. You can cruise down that road. And while you're doing it, it seems fine and it seems easy. But I promise you, when you hit the end of that road, its final destination, you're going to look around and be like, man, I should have taken the narrow, more difficult path because it led to such a better place. And there's a reason that Jesus describes this. He's trying to say, look, I want you to be on the narrow road. And it's easy to look at him and get mad and be like, well, how could he, he, how could he turn people away? How could, he, how could this happen? How does a loving God do this? And he says, listen, I'm not the one who makes that decision. You are. See, Jesus never commanded people to do something they were incapable of doing. Do you realize that? Anytime you read something in scripture and God tells you to do something, you are capable of making a decision. You are capable of doing that thing. And he says, go in through the narrow gate. He's telling them, look, you can do this. I want you to be on that narrow road, but you've got to decide which road you are going to place yourself on. See, Jesus doesn't ultimately determine your final destination. You do. Now, he's made it possible for you to to be in heaven because of his love and his grace and his mercy and his desire and his longing to be close to you. He's, He's made a way for you to do that, but you've got to decide what road You're going to put yourself on, and there's a wide road with a lot of people on it, and there's a narrow road that has few people on it. Look what he says in Luke chapter 13, verse 23 through 25. I think there's a type on your notes. I think it says Luke 1, but it's Luke chapter 13. It says, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try and enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us, but he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Does that sound familiar from the passage we just read? I don't know who you are. You see, when you look at this passage again, Jesus is saying, look, most people are not going to be willing to do what it takes in order to find a, a right saving relationship with him. And, and you can tell by their questions, they don't, like, they don't like his answer, but that's the truth of the matter. Just like our kids, you know, it, it's weird to me with kids, because like when a kid's little or maybe even, you know, as teenagers, sorry, teens, but there, there are times when I will warn my children about something, right? And I'll say, look, if you keep doing that, you're, you're going to pay this consequence. You're not going to like it. Knock it off. Stop doing that, right? And then they do it again. And I'm like, listen. I, I'm not telling you again, stop doing that because you're not going to like what happens if, it, if you do that again, right? And then whether it be a grounding or a swat on my kids' rear when they were kids, you know, like one of those things to where they do it again and then they face that consequence. And then who do they get mad at when they have to face the consequence? You. And you're like, what are you mad at me for? Are you serious? I told you how many times you were going to face this consequence if You didn't do what I said. You could have avoided this catastrophe if you would have only heeded the warnings that I gave you. But you didn't want to listen, and so now you have to deal with the consequence. You see, a really, truly loving parent disciplines their children. And we give our children consequences because we understand if they don't learn to to change their behavior because a consequence that is coming, it is unloving to constantly just let your kids get away with murder and never make them face a consequence for it. Because what you teach them is, is that as they get older, they can ignore God and then everything's still going to be okay. And God says, no, that's not the way it works. There are consequences. And I love people and that's why I warn them and that's why I try to make sure they're on the right path. Because if they get on the wrong path and refuse to leave that path, they're going to face destruction. 
And the reason that I warned you about these things and the reason I've given you my word, the reason that I sent my son who loved you enough to die for you is because I don't want to see that happen. It doesn't have to end that way, but you got some decisions to make about your life because a lot of people aren't going to make the right decision. And you and I, we may get ticked off at Jesus for it, but we're a lot like little kids. We get angry at God for the consequences because we ignored his warnings. And how foolish is it of a child to be mad at a parent for making them face the consequences they'd been warned of, but somehow we think it's okay for us to be angry at God for making us pay the consequences of our decisions and our actions. And while we might be ticked off at Jesus, really, if we were being really real and honest, we know where the blame belongs and we know where the anger should be focused. And it's not on the loving father, it's on the rebellious child that we can be. And so we have got to look at that and and understand it. But that's a tough sell for people today because what our society wants to do is it wants to tell people, oh, a loving God is never gonna deny anyone. So what they do is they take out all the scriptures that deal with hell or consequences and they're like, everybody's good. All you need to do is believe because that fills the seats. If churches, if most churches would teach the truth about what's going on, people wouldn't wanna come to church as much because it's it's something people don't wanna have to change their lives. They don't want to have to repent, even though that's what God tells us is required of us. It's foolish of us to be upset with God whenever he's given us a warning. So if I look at this and I'm like, man, he could be talking to me. And, and it's not surprising. He's warned me about it. What, what do we do in order to make sure that we are someone that God knows? What, do you, what can you do in your life to look and say, okay, I don't want to end up at the end of the road saying, Lord, Lord, and him going, who are you? I don't remember you. I don't know what you're talking about. Where'd you come from? How do we make sure that doesn't happen to us? And if you look at just even in this chapter, Matthew chapter seven, you can find the answers. First of all is if I wanna ensure I'm one that God does know, first of all, I must make sure I know the truth. I have to make sure I understand the truth. Just a few verses before what he says in Matthew chapter seven, in verse 16 through 20, this is what he tells those same people. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do people get bunches of grapes from thorny weeds or do they get figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit and every rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a rotten tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will know them by their fruit. You see, he wants these people to know truth. What he tells them is there are going to be a lot of people who are going to come along and they're going to teach you things that are untrue. And you need to be aware of those people because they will lead you to the wrong path. You see, I I really do feel like in a lot of ways that that's what's happened, especially in the United States. I look at what so many churches are teaching and what's going on and you see what they're, what they're teaching people and the way they're teaching people to live and it's so contrary to what the Bible actually teaches. And that's a scary thing. But if you look what Jesus says, he says you need to watch out for people like that and then he tells them how to watch out for them. He says, listen, these people can teach you the wrong thing. They're gonna read you to, lead you the wrong way. But if you look at the fruit of their lives you will be able to see who you should listen to and who you shouldn't because a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. You know, a few years ago, I I had read this story and it was about uh, Justin Bieber. And uh, for all you believers out there, um, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of like Justin. But anyway, uh, (laughs) so I read this story and it was about him going to this church in Hollywood. And how this church was reaching out to all these A-list Hollywood celebrities and stuff. And in my mind, I'm like, that's awesome. That's so cool. Somebody needs to be in Hollywood helping these people. Because look at their lives. They are a wreck. You know, I don't understand why anybody looks to Hollywood for planning out how they want to live their lives. Because if you look at their lives, you're like, why would you ever want a life like that? But people do. But anyway, I was looking at this and I'm like, that's so cool. There's a church in Hollywood reaching out to people. And at first, I was super excited about it. And then I started hearing some stuff about the Hillsong Church in LA and I was like, what? That doesn't sound real biblical. And then pictures start to surface of Carl Lentz, the pastor of this huge church that's reaching all these people, like doing shots with Justin Bieber on a yacht with half naked girls. And I'm like, hold up, what is going on with this church? And, and you start hearing about these things and you're like, something just doesn't seem right here. They're not. And you, you see, 
that happens all the time. Think about how many ministers and preachers, not just of mega churches, but all over the place where they get caught up and you look at the, the, the things they're teaching. Of course, Carl Lentz isn't going to tell people to stop living the way they're living because he's living that same way. How is he going to teach them the truth when he's ignoring it? And then, you know, even over the past couple of weeks, if, you, if you've paid attention, like, uh, I don't know how many of you guys know who Joshua Harris is, but he wrote a, a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And it was this huge book, like early 2000s-ish, and it was massive. And now he's come out, and he's slowly kind of walked away, but now he says he's denounced his Christian faith completely. The, the worship minister from Hillsong has come out and said, that he's denounced his faith and walked away because he doesn't believe it. And if you look at the reasons for why, why they have, they've walked away, it, they've bought into a lie that isn't true. And they've bought into some things that are hollow and they've bought into the culture and to the society and what it says about the way we should live lives and about what it says about sin. And instead of looking to the word for truth, what they've done is they've thought about how they feel and they worry about, all, it's emotional and it's all cultural. And so they abandon their faith instead of listening to God. And you know, you look at, you look at the guy from Hillsong leaving, I'm like, yeah, well, look what the Hillsong pastors are doing and the way they're living their lives. They're leading people astray. And it happens all of the time and it can happen in our lives. In Hebrews 13, verse seven, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human, nat human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than Christ. You see, a lot of times, rather than listen to the truth, what we do is we buy into all the lies that culture and society and education try to tell us. And, and they're not, I'm not saying there aren't good things to be learned in the world. There definitely are. But also we have to look and say, why do we buy into all these lies? You know, these people are abandoning their faith, these ministers and worship ministers, because they bought into what culture says about God and about sin. And the things that they're believing in are hollow. You know, I look at, I look at the world, guys. We are, we are a, a world that is more medicated than it has ever been. And we're more messed up than we ever have been. And that's not to say there aren't some, some times where medication can't be a good thing. I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you is, the only way for us to, to find the kind of lives and live in the kind of truth we are is through the word of God. And we're not going to find what we're looking for out in the world. That's not where the answers lie. And I've seen that time and time and time again in the members of the Crossings Church. I've seen people who were living lives and their lives were a wreck, but when they start listening to God and they find some solid truth and they start listening to the right people that God has put in their lives and they start holding on to those things rather than the hollow teachings and the traditions that they had believed in for far too long, their lives finally start coming back together and God is able to do amazing things. I need to make sure I know the truth and that I'm not buying into lies. Hebrews 13, 7 basically says the opposite of what Matthew chapter 7, 16 says. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. If you want to find people who are going to teach you the truth, look at the way their lives turn out and you can determine whether or not they're living by the truth. You know, there are people in my life who I can look at and I'm like, I'm not listening to that person no matter what they tell me because I see where they are. One time, uh, my dad was doing a wedding and this guy was telling the, the new couple that was getting ready to get married, he was giving them marriage advice, which sounds great, right? An older man giving you and he goes, but when your sentence ends with something like, and I should know I've been married five times before, that's a person that you're probably like, yeah, I'm good. I'm going to listen to somebody else. Because you look at the outcome of their way of their life and their decision, you're like, do I want to learn from this person? Or do I want to learn from someone who has successfully had a family and who has done these things? And at the Crossing Church, that's not a put down to anybody because we have a lot of people who have been there. But now they're listening to God and their lives have turned around and people are able to listen to them because their lives have changed so much. And, and we need to look for people like that to follow. If you want to find truth, find godly people who are able to teach you that. So if I'm going to ensure that I'm one who God does know, I must know the truth. Second, I must choose to do what God wants, not what I want. In Matthew 7, 21, right after he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, he goes on to say, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, listen, there are a lot of people out there who will claim Christianity, who will claim to be disciples or followers of mine, and they'll say they believe, but those people aren't all going to end up in heaven. The ones who end up in heaven, the ones who end up with me in the end, are the people who do the will of the Father. 
They're the ones who make the decision that says, listen, I'm no longer going to do what I want to do, but I'm going to surrender my life to Christ and live the way that he called me to. You see, whenever people are baptized, they may not realize this, but when they're baptized into Christ, what Romans 6 says baptism is, is a picture of you saying, I'm alive and I'm living the way that I want to right now. And I live by my own will. But when I'm baptized into Christ, I'm laying my life down, I'm laying my will down, and I'm putting it to death, and I'm to be raised new in the will of God. And from now on, whenever I make decisions about my life, they're going to be based upon God's will, not what I desire or what I long for. In, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, it says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, your will must be done, not mine. See, this is Jesus talking here. And he says, listen, I, he, he's getting ready to go to the cross is what's happening. And he's praying to God and he's like, I don't want to do this. Like the human part of Jesus did not want to go to the cross because he knew what he was about to face. But he also knew there was much more at stake than that. And so he looks to the Father and he sets the perfect example for you and I of living in God's will. And he says, listen, God, this is what I want. But if it's not what you want, I'm going to do it your way. And that's why Jesus was able to walk to the cross that's the reason that he died, is because he looked and he said, my will is not near as important as your will, God, and if this is going to enable all of those people to have a relationship with me, I'll go to the cross. You know, every Sunday at the Crossing Church, we take the Lord's Supper, and we take the Lord's Supper because it's a reminder of what Jesus did for us. And it's really a celebration that says, look, we do not deserve God's love, his grace, and his mercy whatsoever. And we are never going to be able to earn it. But because he loved us enough, he was willing to lay down his life and his will for us. In just a moment, we're going we're to take the Lord's Supper. And as we take it, as you take that bread, which represents Jesus' body that was broken for you. And as you take that cup, which represents his blood that was spilled for you. One of the things that I want us to think about today is about God's will and what that means for our lives. Because what Jesus was doing at the cross when he died for you and I was he was saying the Father's will is more important to me and the Father's will was that you would be saved. And when we take that and we say, I'm trying to be like Jesus, and when you take that cup and you take that bread and you say, I want to be like him, what you're really saying is it's time for me to lay down my will and to do God's will instead of what I desire. And when we do that, that's what enables us to be able to take advantage of the fact that Jesus died for us. That's what is, is able to allow us to end up with him in the end. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, God, I just want to thank you for being a God who loves us, God. And uh, God, we didn't deserve your, your love and your grace and your mercy whatsoever. God, we're a mess. But your son was willing to come and lay down his life and his will for us, God. And I pray that as we, we look into your word today that you'll help us to realize we need to do the same thing. God, because we want to do the will of the Father who is in heaven because we want you to be able to look at us someday and not say, I don't know you, but say, welcome home. And God, uh, your son's love and grace and our trust and faith in him, God, is what you say allows that. Help us to never forget that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the whole reason that uh, you and I even have the ability to have a relationship with God, the whole, the whole reason that we are able to lay down our will uh, and do God's will is because Jesus already set that example for us and he already did that himself. And we're called to be like him. In 1 John 2 verses 3 through 6 in the message paraphrase, it says it like this. Here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. Keep his commandments. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived. You see, he's saying the same exact thing Jesus said. He says, listen, if you're going to be like me, if you're going to be in right relationship with me, if you're going to end up in heaven with me someday, then the way that I lived was in submission to God by laying down my will and accepting his instead. And all of us, you know, we, like I said, we get ticked off because we look at those passages like this and we're like, yeah, he's talking to me. And what he tells you and I in this passage and over and over again in scripture is you want to be right with me you need to do what I say and again that's so contrary to what most churches teach today what most churches want to tell people is listen you can come into church on Sunday morning you can believe in God and, and you can leave here and never think about him again and you can leave here and you can live your life however you want and you're still going to be right with God but when you look at what the word of God actually teaches that is not what it says God expects us to lay down our will and he le- expects us to live with him. You know, that passage is challenging, 1 John 2, 3. You know, it says, if someone claims I know him well but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. He says, look, the truth isn't in you if you say you know God but you don't do what he says. And all of us need to look at that and take that as a challenge and say, listen, now, there's some changes that I need to make in my life. You know, Rick Warren says that if you, if you, he's talking to preachers and he says, uh, if you're preaching the word of God to people on Sundays, but you're not giving them a way to apply what they're hearing, you're failing as a preacher. Because he says the whole purpose of preaching and the whole purpose of God's word and reading it is so that you can apply what you learn and actually do it. And see, in in our lives, sometimes I think we look at the Word of God and we're like, yeah, it's a nice book to read, but we don't understand that it's meant to be obeyed, that we're supposed to do what it actually says. And when we don't, that puts us outside of a right relationship with God if we don't repent. See, if I want to ensure that I'm someone God knows, I, I have to know the truth. I have to choose to do what God wants, not what I want. And the third thing is, is that I need to obey the Word of God to build my foundation, Right after this, that passage in Matthew 7, in verse 24, he says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great clash. See, all of us look, and we want to have this incredibly good life, right? No one wants their lives to fall apart. No one wants to see their house and their life crumble 
Nobody longs for that. We all look and we're like, man, I want that good life. I want that kind of family. And for a lot of people here at the crossings, they look and they're like, man, I want something so different than what I grew up in, right? And, and they look and they're like, I, and, and they understand it. If I'm going to have that, I have to do something differently than my parents did. I have to do something differently than I was doing before Christ. And I need to start listening to him. You see, my son, my 10-year-old son, Lincoln, likes Legos. And there are times where I've seen him come home and he has a pretty complicated Lego set, right? And he, his older sister, Kennedy, will sit down with him and, you know, she'll go through the directions and they will build a Lego set together. Or Jackson will sit down and help him and they'll actually go through and they'll, like, follow the directions and you build this house and you're like, whoa, that's crazy. It looks just like the picture. Who would have thought, right? You know, but then there are also times where Lincoln's like, I've got this and he'll, I'm just going to look at the picture and build it. Right? And instead of paying attention to the instructions, he builds something else and he'll bring it over and go, look, dad. And I'll look at it and be like, yeah, you're creative, aren't you? (laughs) Because you look at it and you're like, that's not what it's supposed to look like. And not only that, but you know it's not going to hold up and stay because it wasn't built correctly. And then when it comes to our lives and our relationship with God, we want God to know who we are, but we don't want to do what it takes to actually look like what we should. We're not willing to look at the instructions and say, okay, if I'm going to build my life the correct way, I've got to do what he says. I need to follow these instructions. And he says, listen, the people who who follow the instructions and do what my word says, when they build a house, they have a solid, secure foundation underneath of them. And no matter what the storms of life throw at them, they're going to be okay. And I've been fortunate enough to watch people here at the crossings pick up the pieces from their old lives and start rebuilding their lives and shaping them and doing what God says. And and I've seen them hit by some tragedies and some horrible things that you would think would just destroy them, but their house is still standing because it's set on the right foundation. And most of the members here at the Crossings Church know what it's like to build their foundation on sand, to ignore the word of God and do whatever they want and live in their own will rather than God's will. And they've seen the results and they felt the consequences of what happens when you don't do it God's way. And the reason that they've turned to him and started doing it his way is because no one wants to experience that again. You know, one of the fears sometimes I have for our younger generation, for our teens, and especially the ones who are, are children of people who've been coming to church for a long time, is that they will forget what life without God is like. That they'll forget what their parents' lives were like before they started listening to God, and they'll think somehow that their parents have this great life, and they have this good life because of something they did, and they will abandon, and they'll go and do and live however they want, expecting that same kind of life. And the storms of life are going to come down hard and destroy their lives unless they understand the reason they have a solid foundation. The reason they have a good life is because someone before them listened to God and did what he said. See, you and I have got to to look at God's word and say, all right, he says if I want to have a good life, if I, I want him to know me at the end, I need to obey him. Otherwise, it's going to come crashing down around me. James 1, 22 through 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, will be blessed in all they do. He says, listen, the word of God is meant to be like a mirror that shows you what you look like. And that you look at it and you're, you're supposed to make changes. Sometimes, you know, we use the, the analogy like, you know, you don't get up in the morning and go look in the mirror and like see, you know, the, the eye boogers and the crust on your mouth and your hair is like crazy, right? And, and, and you look at it and you're like, all right, time to go to work. And you walk out of the house and go to school or work like that, right? You would be a fool to be that stupid, right? Now, judging by some of you, you might have done that this morning. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> just you, Jason. Um, <laughs> but... But, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you make adjustments when you look into a mirror, and that's what God's word is designed to be like as well. It's designed to be something to where we look into it, and we look and we see the things that need to be changed, and we make those adjustments so that we are able to leave better than when we looked in it. And the word of God is supposed to be like that, and it says, listen, you need to look into the perfect law that gives freedom, but then it doesn't even stop there, and it says, and continue in it, and then it says it again, not forgetting what you've heard, but doing it, you'll be blessed in what you do. See, we, I think we all will want to spend eternity with God, but I also think we want to have good lives here. God says the only way for you to have both of those things, that great life you're longing for here, and that eternity with God in heaven, the only way for you to experience that 
is through trusting in God. You see, belief, again, isn't an intellectual thought that God exists. It's a faith that says, I can put my foot on that and I can trust it. I can stand on top of this. I can do what God says. I believe in him enough that it spurs me to action. James, in the next chapter after this, says, look, faith without following up with doing what God says without works or deeds is dead. And what he's saying is there's not a disconnection between faith and deeds. See, what people tell you is that they say you can't earn your salvation. You're right. You can't earn your salvation. You don't deserve it at all. But God still expects you to, to work towards it. He says that several times in scripture. I think of it kind of like if I, if I wrap you up this beautiful present, right? And I bring it to you and I'm like, here you go. I'm giving this you this, not because you deserve it, because I love you and I care for you. And I set it down and it's all pretty wrapped. In order to experience the joy of what's inside of that, you still have to do some work, even though I gave it to you out of grace and love. But you still have to open the present in order to put it to use, don't you? And whenever it comes to our relationship with God, we have that same kind of thing where God's like, yeah, I want you to believe in me. I want you to have faith in me. But that shows up in what you do, in the way you live, and in your obedience to me. And if you want to be right with me, you need to do my will and not your own. In 2 Timothy 3.15, it says this. You have been, this is Timothy, or Paul talking to Timothy, this young man in the faith. And he says, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. You know, in another version, it says, he says, hey, Timothy, you've known the scripture since infancy, and they're able to make you wise to salvation. See, if you want to know how to be saved, you want to know how to get before God on the last day and stand before him and him say, come on, good job, my faithful servant, come on in. If that's what you long for, you're going to find that because of the grace and mercy and love of God, but you're also going to find it whenever you allow yourself to trust him enough to do what he says, to get into his word and find out what the Bible actually teaches about salvation. God is longing for a relationship with all of us. He never commands you to do something you can't do. So when he tells you to get on the narrow road, it's because he wants to see you and he wants to know you and he wants you to stay on it. And, he, and he's, he's already allowed his son to die so that you could have a relationship with him. It's an incredible and powerful thing. But he says, listen, just because I've done that doesn't mean there aren't expectations I have for you as well. See, every week at the crossings, we ask you to fill out a thing in your, in your notes called the crossings communication card. And, and the important things, go ahead and pull it out and look at it. The important things on that card aren't the place where it is for your name or your address or your email address or your phone number. Those aren't the important parts of that card. Those are cool because, you know, we can tell you about cool stuff we have coming up and you can develop relationships and get in small groups easier that way. But the important part of that card is the part where you make decisions, where it says my decision today. For some of you, you look at this and you're like, man, I, I don't even know... I, how do I know if I should believe and trust the Bible or do what it says in the first place? I don't know much about it. Then check out like a personal Bible study and learn what God's word has to say. Make an informed decision about it for others. Some of you out there today, you've already made that decision a long time ago that you wanted to follow God. And you said that you believe in him, but it really hasn't shown up much in your life. And you may be looking, you may be thinking, man, I've been doing this on my own and I can't do it anymore. I'd like to join a small group. Or maybe you just need to recommit and say, yeah, I say I believe in Jesus, but it doesn't really show up in my life. I need to recommit to making him the Lord and master of my life. And I need to bow before him in, in submission to him and remember what I did. You know, for, for different people in here, it's different things. Maybe it's just a prayer request. God, help me to do this. Help me to stand strong. Maybe it's I need a small group because I can't do this on my own. And I know I can't because I've tried it before. But... The truth of the matter is, is if we walk away and we don't do something with God's word, we've wasted our time here this morning. If we don't make some changes based upon what we hear in God's word in our lives, we've wasted our time looking into it all because it's a book that was designed to be followed and obeyed. And God loves you and he longs for us and he's given us warnings. And he said, listen, you don't have to end up on the wrong side of this. You can end up on the right side. Make sure you know the truth. Make sure you know the will of God and you do it. And then obey his word and allow him to build an incredibly beautiful life that ends with him looking at you and saying, I'm so glad you're here. Instead of saying, I don't even know who you are. 
In just a moment, our, our worship team's gonna, they're gonna sing a song. And during that first song, that's your chance for you to fill out that card. And for our members, you know, you need to, we want everybody to fill out that card, not just if you're visiting with us today, every single person, because it's an opportunity for you to put down on paper, this is what I'm gonna do with what I've heard from God's word. And then uh, during the second song, we'll stand up and the worship team will sing and we'll pass the baskets around. Uh, for our members, we need your card and your contribution as that goes by. Well, our members, we need your card because we need you to be changing and growing because again, the fruit of your life is what's gonna show that to other people. If you're not living it, we're not gonna be able to help other people, but also your, your contribution so we can keep the ministries going at the crossings. If you're a guest today, don't put your money in as that basket goes by. We didn't get you here to get your money from you. Just put that card in there and just allow God a chance to really change and bless your life through his word. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, again, I just wanna thank you for being a, a God who's willing to say the difficult and hard things to us, God. We all need those people in our lives and we need that from you. And God, I pray that you will help us to be people who uh, aren't surprised by that, but will heed your warnings to, to stay on the narrow road, God, and that we'll listen to you, that we'll do that by making sure we know what the truth is, God, and that we're submitting to it and to your will. And God, that we're willing to obey uh, your word, God, and that you can build a foundation that uh, nothing that happens in the world and in our lives can destroy the, the house that you've built, God. Help us to always love you and put you first. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.